Jim, could you tell me a bit about your background, your family's political history, like uh, their involvement with the Fenians, your grand-aunt, who was the first secretary of Common Oman in at its formation in Cork City in 1914? Yeah, well, first thing I should say, like with respect to my going back on ancestors, um, is that my mother and my father were both only children. Consequently, I was brought up. I had no aunts on either side. I had no uncles on either side. So I have to go back a generation at least before that. But I'd like to start by mentioning a great-grandfather of mine, a David O'Brien. He was a Fenian and a prominent member of the GAA in County Cork, in the west of the county. He was a, a supporter of Dawnies, the Dawnies, that's not the middle Dawney. And um, he was the representative for West Cork in the late 90s for several years at the Cork, at Cork County Board level. Um, he was involved in the 1890 celebrations in a prominent way, in Bandon, back in those days, and uh, spoke off of platforms at the time. Uh, one of his favourite uh, speeches had to do with Thigan Osna, which had to do with 1798, you know. But as well as that, he walked in the railways, and there was a big strike and it was a big strike in Cork, in Bandon, and all out West Cork, in the, on the railway, in 1898-99 period. It was big. Scabs were brought in from England, housed in the city, and they went out and done the usual blackleg jobs. He was a, a, a clerk at the time. On, on the, in the railway, and with another man who was a clerk as well, they joined with the labouring men who were on strike. Uh, having seen first as uh, clerical people ha which ha who had to do with the payment of the men, he first saw to it that they were paid that week, and then he and his friend joined the strike. They were out for weeks and weeks and criticised from all, all sides. He lost his job after 35 years of employment. Uh, he came to the city and opened a, a bar in, pa in Parnell Place. It was well known in Cork in the early part of the century. It was known as the West Cork Bar. His daughter well, he had several daughters, one of them who was my grandmother, Elizabeth. Uh, there was, she had a sister, Nora O'Brien, who uh, joined in 1906, when she was about uh, tw early 20s, I'd say, uh, the, 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 uh, the Celtic Literary Society, of which the... the the, the foremost person in that group was Terence McSweeney. Thus began her association with his sister Mary, which lasted for many years. Uh, they were incidentally um, merged 
in around 1906 with Inina Heron, Daughters of Ireland, founded by Margon McBride, who I understand she knew as well. And um, they formed the National Council of Sinn Féin. In 1914, when the volunteers came into being, she was elected first secretary of the organisation of Common Amman. And so but was she being quite left wing? Because he obviously would have been your great grandfather if he was involved with the trade unions and things like that. Well I, I suppose she would have been all right, like you know, I, I could I I don't have the exact information back then. Mm. Um, unfortunately, like I should say this as well, I'm going forward a little bit on this now. Uh, like a lot of other people of her persuasion, they did not, apply, uh, number one, apply for pensions. And secondly, in the late 40s, there was a committee sent up, uh, I think it was based in um, the Cora. Uh, they, put up, they put together an archive from people who were prominent and involved in the Republican movements. And it was subscribed to by many of those people at the time. I checked both. I didn't expect to find her on it. Not her husband, who was, when she married, was Jack Martin. But, no, they weren't on it. Like So, it, it isn't easy to get the information. But her name pops up here, there and everywhere, like, you know. She was arrested. There were two women arrested, uh, primarily, it's recorded in... Uh, Shivasi's book on, on, on Terence McSweeney. She and Mary McSweeney were arrested in 1916. I think there was about a dozen men arrested as well. But as you know, Cork didn't rise. My grandfather, who would be a, a, a brother-in-law of ours, uh, marched out, as they say in Cork, from Cork City to McCroom on the day. They were broken, <laughs> like you know, they felt bad because of the way things went with McNeil and the North and what happened in Dublin. Uh, McCurtain and uh, McSweeney felt it badly. They always felt bad about the failure of Cork to rise in 1916. But she was involved and she was OC of the. Uh, I, I'm going now to a certain extent on that last bit of information on the obituary when she died in 1956. She was OC of the Active Service Unit of Common Amman and Cork. She was involved in the, at the rising that they thought they were going to have. She was the person who had the responsibility for putting together uh, houses, places for combatants, uh, people injured the populace, you know, if there was anything occurred, which of course happened in Dublin of course as well uh, she was involved in many activities in, the, in, the, in that particular period. Now what a lot of people don't know is that of all the places in Ireland Rebel Cork when it came to the treaty period the common man went pro-treaty uh, she and Mary McSweeney would have been seen as the leaders at the time of the anti-treaty people. And uh, at a meeting in the Ungrianon, which was situated in Queen Street, uh, it's Father Matthew Street today, uh, of Common Amman, in January 1922, to she had the honour of proposing the opposition position to what evidently was on the day a majority who were pro treaty. And she spoke trenchantly against the treaty. She stayed with the Republican forces uh, right throughout the 20s, was very active. And she parted with them in the late 30s. Now, 
so did her husband, Jack Martin. Jack, incidentally, it's recorded in uh, a book there, uh, McIntyre, Mickey, I am I'm not sure under the name, but by Mick McCarthy, a courtman, uh, was giving his reminiscences. Uh, in the early 30s, her husband, Jack Martin, was the OC of the 1st Cork Brigade. They, they parted with the movement in the late, maybe 38, 39, I don't know, 38, as a result of differences that had arisen within the Republican Army at the time. That was between Tom Barry and his supporters in Cork and Sean Russell, where Sean Russell was pushing for the, the campaign that subsequently occurred in England, a bombing campaign. Uh, Tom Barry favoured an attack, almost like a 1916 rising affair, in Armagh, where they take Armagh and dig in. The Cork uh, group were to be foremost in it, of occupying and staying there and fighting it out. Uh, it didn't occur. Barry was brought it down and as a result of it people left the movement at the time. Like we've always had these differences though but that's my knowledge of that situation. Now if I were to pass on and say to you that things are different at other sides of the, part of, of the, the thing. My mother was laying as well. Getting quickly to the point, my mother's father died in 1914, killed in action in Flanders, 25 years of age, four days before Christmas. He would have been one of those people who were sung about in later years of Christmas of 1914. Uh, what happened? That was the time that they came out into the no man's land and they buried their dead. Thousands had died. He was kind of, con he was with a Scottish regiment. And as well as that, the Indians, Indian forces had, were involved as well. He died and sometime later, 1915, his brother died as well in Flanders. Uh, that was two. But you know, 1916, 2016, a hundred years it's upon us. You see, 1916 marked a big change in the thinking of Irish people. We lost our leaders. It's terrible what happened, but it changed an awful lot of people's minds. And what I found of a great interest when I was looking back on family, genealogy, and those things that I'd done in more recent years, was that my grandfather, my granduncle, there was one other brother left and in 1917 he joined the Irish Volunteers on the north side of the city. He was part of the 1st Cock Brigade, joined the IRA and he remained with them until 1923 where he had a short period of detention in Cork. He supported the anti-treaty forces. Uh, he uh, was a, a, obviously an uncle to my mother. And my mother had an unfortunate beginning in life in the sense she was the only child. Her father had died and like a lot of other people of that period, it was tough. She was orphaned 
and there weren't any great services there at the time. Her mother couldn't hack it, and she ended up in the county home. And another side of the family, the Meehans, uh, which came on the female side of the family, they signed her out, they took her out of the county home. She came out in bad condition. It was a bad start. Her mother, as I said, couldn't hack it. She took a few drinks. Okay. She married within 18 months of the husband dying. Uh, incidentally, like, I said, the church must have stopped, tried to stop it. Because she married in a registry office. He and, her, and the man in question, they were both RCs, which was queer, queer like back in those days. They ended up there. I just, just, just an assumption on my part. She had a bad start. But the thing about it was, at a very early age, like she used to tell me how she remembered the Ballycannon boys who were killed in 1921, six of them up in Blarney Street, savaged by RUC, RIC men. A lot of them, they were all killed. They were brought into the cathedral in Cork City. It waked. The whole city were in mourning over it. Even some of the religious, like the bishop, had sympathy at that particular time. And it, it had a, a deep effect on her. At that time, like she'd have been about eight years of age. But at an early stage, and the Meehans, uh, obviously, a sister on this, she became a member of the young girls section. I suppose they, they were later known as coming to Colini. Maybe that's what they were in those days. She became a member of that section of the Republican movement. And she, in time, as her age went on, ended up in coming a man. And she stayed there until about 1936 when she was about 23 years of age. And when I was a young person, she often told me about that life, you know. Because we're talking about the influences that were on me, mm -hmm. you know. Um, she had a first cousin. They were again from the horse side of the family. He was uh, known Dunny McSweeney. He was on the south side of the city. She was a great friend of his as his child, a couple of years, some years older than him, like, you know, but they were good friends. And he ended up in the Cora in the 1940s. Great Irish and great Irish speaker. And he'd done his time inside there. That was another thing. And as I said, uh, there was the uncle then who was um, Republican as well, you know. So... That's about it, like, you know, with respects to the, what I would call, the positive influences as to why I should end up with Republicans at some stage. And Jim, could you tell me how and when you first got involved in the Republican movement? And could you tell me about the Cork Volunteer Pipe Band? I will, yes. Uh, now, I was a member of the Cork Volunteer Pipe Band. And I'll come to that a bit later, but I want to say to you that in the early 50s, I was politicised. I, I had read a lot. I would have read all the books that were coming out, the Tom Barry books, the Florio Dunno books, the Dan Breens, and the whole lot of them. Important to say as well, that at school and those years, I was getting all the usual propaganda stuff. I knew all about Rye of the Rovers and Rockfist Rogan and all these guys who are, the, who are the heroes of the Second World War and what have you. Mind you, I have nothing problem. I know problem was about the Second World War. I thought, I think myself, that the Allied situation was something I would have supported if I were a, a, a man at the time because they were fighting fascism and that was a just fight. 
I mentioned that probably somewhere later of people I knew who were Republicans and ended up out there. But I, I, I began to become interested at the earliest stage when I became aware that um, things were happening nationally. Now, at that, at, at those, in those early years, you had very much to the fore a grouping called the Anti-Partition Committee, who spoke a lot about the division of the country. And yeah, that influenced me. By the way, I should mention as well that my father helped me in that direction. But my father wasn't what I'd call a Republican of the sort that his aunt, Nora Martin was, or no, sorry, Nora O'Brien Martin was. Uh, he had been in the Free State Army during the 40s. He actually thought he was defending the country, as a lot of them did at the time, you know. Uh, but uh, he used to bring me to these things. And as a matter of fact, when I was a child, I was brought down I was only two or three months old when he brought me down to Cove to see the takeover of the ports in 1938, the year of my birth. But uh, I became interested in a broad way. But I began to get a little bit of uh, further information later when in 1951 I, I heard that the IRA had made an attack, a raid, on the Eglintine Barracks in Derry, which I found subsequently in later years was led by Manus Canning, uh, where they, they, they took machine guns and rifles out of it. Later then, uh, in July 52, there was an attempt from a British Army training, training school in Felstead in Essex to acquire weapons as well. Manus Canning was also there, as was Cahill Goulding and Sean McStephon. And was Roy O'Brady, was he involved in that? Um, no, I think it was later at that stage. Uh, Rory was involved in the Arborfield raid, which was uh, about 1954. Around 56 or no, 55, I'd say. Okay. Um, but they got 108 rifles and they got Sten guns and Bren guns and all the rest of it. But uh, that was in uh, Felstead in Essex. But um, they, were, they, they were arrested, as you probably know, like, you know. And um, there was another man. At that particular time, um, oh, Seamus Murphy, he was arrested in the town there. And, um, no, but I think that was a later, a later job. But in June '54, you had the the raid on the Gough Barracks in Armagh, which was a resounding success. A pile of stuff was taken out of that, over 300 weapons. Now, I understand some of them were what we call DPs. Uh, that would be drill purpose stuff, you know. And we used to train out our own cross valley in the 50s with that stuff. Uh, uh, Charlie Murphy and uh, Eamon Boyce, both Dubliners, were very much involved in the OMA, in, in the Gough Barracks OMA. And I think Sean Garland, was he inside then? Was he yeah, the I see, yes, he, he, he was, yeah. Before and in 54, there was an attempt made to repeat the same thing with Gough Barracks in Armagh. And um, uh, sorry, uh, no, we, we were talking about Felstead, but Gough Barracks took place in 53, um, and in 54 it was that Lissanelli in Oma 
was raided unsuccessfully. Several people were arrested. It was a high water mark for me because out there like it looked to me to be something happening up north. But it's queer how things turn out. There were three corpsmen arrested. Liam Mulcahy, Sean O'Callaghan and Sean Hagerty. And I suddenly realised that there was something there for me. Why not join? And I joined immediately following that. I wasn't deterred at all by people being arrested and caught. I joined and I remember when I went in first, I went up the stairs and they were all there and I was very kind of slow to, I thought I'd be asking for too much to join the IRA. I said, can I join Sinn Féin? And yes, I was taken in, but sure in a few weeks I was in the IRA, as I also was in the Cock Volunteer Pipe Band. Now, I, I think I'll just do this for a sec, just for a second and mention the Cock Volunteer Pipe Band. The Cock Volunteer Pipe Band was always, for the Republican movement in Cork, something treasured. It was formed originally in Cork in 1914 by Thomas McCurtain. That's the senior man because was, his son had the same name later, uh, who was murdered by the RUC. Um, he formed it as a section of the IRA at the time. And it maintained that position all down through the years. Most of the people involved uh, in those times were um, also members of the IRA. Later, when we went up to the north for Operation Harvest, there were several members, about four members of the band in the IRA uh, who went across the border. Uh, well, as I say, that was something that was instrumental to me and then things went on. 55, we had Tom Mitchell and Phil Clark winning seats in the Westminster elections. Other things were happening. Sierra attacked, um, uh, Sierra rather, yeah. uh, attacked Rossley Barracks in November, led by Liam uh, Kelly. They lost Connie Green of Derry. And a Cork man was up there too, uh, Kevin Neville, a man who had been at one stage in the IRA, but that's another story. Uh, in 56, things were happening to it in the Republican movement. Uh, a man called uh, Norman Latchford was dismissed from Sinn Féin because he wrote a book in, wherein he made some criticisms of the church's role during the famine period. Uh, uh, that wasn't finalised in 56 at the time. Um, and then we went on and I had an accident, old training, and I was in hospital for a while and uh, I was dismissed from the job for not turning up to work, but um, we were sent up north at that stage. But let me say this before I go into that. The atmosphere at that time in Cork was excellent amongst the volunteers. Seeing what was happening around with arms, raids and what have you, they were all mad, inching to become involved in the arms struggle. Uh, there were splits we were hearing of in Dublin. Uh, the McChrystal people were being mentioned. There was already the Sarola business in the, no in, in the north. Uh, and we were getting bad vibes out of that. We had nothing like that in Cork. So we went up there feeling good about it. Now, several of the Cork people who went up, went up several weeks in advance. 
and they were seconded to different areas uh, to either initiate or help local commanders in those areas. In the end of 56, in December, we left Mayfield and Cork in a lorry and we were brought up to a place called Atboy in County Meath. And that was more or less a jumping off stage. There we met people from Limerick, there were six of them. We met people from Wexford, uh, people from, some people from Dublin and what have you, before we went on then into the north on the 11th of December in anticipation of striking a blow on the 12th of December. Oh. Uh, um, Could you, would you be able to tell us something about your involvement then in Operation Harvest? Yeah, I'll, I'll go on there. Um, we were designated the West Tyrone area. We were under the command of two Dublin volunteers, um, Paddy Webster and Jerry Higginbottom. There were two people from Limerick. Uh, there was one Wexford man, uh, Ted Morrissey. Uh, in Hull Island, holding holder two years before that, I think Cork took it in 56, hurling. Uh, there were four uh, all together from Dublin and um, there was 11 in our unit. Our target was the Lissanelli barracks where the IRA had had a failure two years before that when they attempted to to seek arms there, and several people were caught, including those three men that I mentioned earlier there. Now, what I'm saying like has been acknowledged actually by one of those men uh, who, who died only in recent times, um, Jerry Higginbottom, was that he thought he was in charge no, sorry. He, he thought Webster was in charge, and Webster thought he was in charge when they arrived, to, when they met together, in, in, on the that night, that evening, in Oma. And the preparations were that they were to collect um, explosives from a quarry in, in uh, Mountfield, outside of uh, Oma. And, as I say, uh, Jerry in his notes said that they committed a serious error of judgment. The two of them went together with a driver, left the remaining nine waiting near the side of the road, as you might say, outside of Oma for the job, depending and the ammunition, or sorry, the, the angelic night, to come over from Mountfield. And coming near to the time of go, there was no sign of them. And explosions started to occur. Sirens were, si uh, were sh going as well. It, it became all, all over the north at the time. Th there was something on and we waited, and we waited, and the two lads never appeared. What we found out later was, in fact, it took a few days before we met up with them, was that the, um, the, lo the, the lorry that they were coming back in with a big pile of e explosive in it, the driver went off the road, he went into a ditch, and they had to they couldn't get it out and they had to start putting stuff into their uh, gear, you know. And they walked back, but by the time they got back, we, leaderless, decided we had to get out of the bloody place. And we were taken by the local people into the mountains, into um, the 
back feels off a bit like, you know. Um, and could they understand you talking with a different accent? Did they find it difficult? Oh my God, yes. Oh yeah, yeah. We couldn't really talk, like, you know, we would be advised to keep your mouth shut <laughs> because you'd be known all over the place. And you know, back in those days, there wasn't that much uh, inter-relations between Tyrone and Cork. And they, like, they, they, our accents would be known immediately, like, you know, so we had to keep quiet. And we let the, the, our guides, the local people, help us, like, in that sense. But it, it wasn't much of a problem going through mountainous areas, through the Spurns. Uh, it, it wasn't at all a problem, like, <laughs> you know. But it was a great disappointment, like, to us at the time. We, there was nothing we could do. Um, I, I should mention something else as well, because I was comparing, in later times, I was comparing uh, notes, as one might say, with uh, some people who were uh, amongst a group of Cork people who were in the north of the county. That's to say, um, uh, North uh, Antrim. There were several of them arrested in Torhead. Tony Cooney, Jimmy Linehan, Willie Goff. They too found that when the guns were being distributed, they were meagre. I remember being given the job of going into the the guard room in Lisinelli and you were expected to go in guns blazing. I was given a Thompson and I put my hand out. It was a, a, a magazine shoved into it like and I put my hand out for the rest and I was told there wasn't any more. One magazine well, they were supposed to be holding 20, 20 rounds at max, but there would never be that much, or you'd only strain it too much. And when I said, I, I, I need more, what happens? And it's gone. Uh, he put his hand in his pocket and he took out and gave me a fist of stuff. <laughs> I could always laugh. And the same with Brendan O'Neill, he found the same situation there. There was very poor. As I say, as well as that, the, the, the explosive was coming later. They happened the, it happened the same way above in, in North Antrim, at Thompson, and spare rounds and things like that. It, 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 it like, was pathetic. Uh, I must say, like, in retrospect, it didn't hit me on the night. It didn't hit me for a long time, because we were so wound up like for, to do our job and what was there, we would have taken on anything. But, do you know, to be honest about it, I'd say if we went in that night, <laughs> given the, the, what would you expect, that they would have had some awareness because of what had happened in the past in, in, in Oma, we'd have been more down. And we were in the north for very long. We were there, and we were probably the longest there. We were there for about a month. Uh, it, it was, it was uh, maybe the, the end of the first week of January before we came out. We came out through Straban. And was it a cold January? Oh, well, yes, I mean... And what did you do for food? We got it from local people. I mm -hmm. mind you, they weren't kind of aware that they'd be giving it to us. They gave it freely. And I can tell you at that time, people were very impoverished. We felt a bit bad like about taking stuff from people. But it did get bad at times. Like we were in a house on Christmas Day, 1956. Uh, there was, it, it was a house that was being built. There was no running water. Uh, there was no cookers or anything. We used to use an old fireplace. And... On Christmas Day, I have a long memory of this, we went out with cans and we filled it with snow and came in and melted it down to drink water. You know, um, do you know, I, I want to say, like, that the lads at the time, even those in charge, we held nothing against the 
shocked that we got at the lack of what was there available. Because things that got bad. I believe myself like that, that campaign, McCurtain originally, by the way, opposed taking part at that time. He opposed the start of it. He was outvoted. Uh, it, well, the Army Council usually had seven people. He was outvoted six to one. But he accepted majority rule and went back and done his best. I mean, he, he, he didn't slack at all. He done his best. Like There's no question about that. But um, there were splits. Some people felt big in themselves and they, they were challenging the Tony McCann at the time for leadership. And a lot of them were in Dublin. And the, camp, the, the, the membership in Dublin was really run down a great amount. And you could see it uh, with the people that came up. There wasn't as many from Dublin as we would have hoped. And some of them were young as well. I was 18. There was a lad alongside of me from Dublin, he was 17. I mean, I think there have been people that war in places for 17 at all times, but people at that age, well, I had two years' experience of training. They don't have much experience of things. And we had, we had commanders, leaders in the different areas, 17 and 18 years of age, running the situation. Uh, they had to make do done their best. And the thing with well, it did, sorry, just to tell you, it didn't turn out as Operation Harvest was predicted, which was predicted they turn out, because we were to operate, hopefully we would take over areas of the north, and there'd be no no-go areas. In a sense, they were looking back an awful lot to the, to the, the struggle in Ireland 18, or 1919-20s on. Uh, and, to a, and to a great extent, to be honest, to Tom Barry yeah. and what he done and the clear areas he the clear areas he created in Cork, and it, it didn't work because as I, we said, well, we probably going out after over four weeks would have been probably one of the crowds who were like longest in there. In a very few days, it, it began to be very much a border campaign, in and out across the border and things like that. Uh, but you were still able you know. to, in that period you were there, you were still able to carry out operations as Look, best you could? We didn't carry out too many operations. All that was involved in most cases was soft targets. At that, in those days, they blew up uh, transformers and different things like that. They put dock trees on roads to prevent traffic and of, of the military and things like that. And of course, uh, that was at an early stage, but as time went on, the, um, the Brits were quite uh, clever enough. They stayed in barracks at night. They didn't rush out to go into an ambush at all, you know? And um, as much as you could detest the, the B specials. They served a positive function for the British forces. They knew the areas. They knew where to go. They were very indisciplined. They'd push you about and what have you. But um, uh, they knew their stuff in that sense. A lot of them were expert soldiers as well. They had a fair bit of, of thing. And it, it, they shot themselves in the foot long term because they didn't they didn't behave themselves very often. It's interesting too that we were talking again recently of about four or five of us who had been up there having a chat out West Cork there one day. And another thing, like we said, one fellow said, Do you know? We were fighting a gentleman's war. And they were putting, they were looking, they were saying, for a start, in the south, we threw our weapons down. We weren't going to engage with the Free State. We put our weapons down. When we went into the north, we gave them the RUC 
a week's notice as to what side they were going to be on, as if we should ever doubt it. But the, that was the situation. No, somebody will say to me, ah, but this happened and that happened the first week and the first night. No, there was an exception to it. If you were, a, if you were attacked, if there was some response from the RUC firing at you, you could respond. Yeah, but you didn't initiate anything. The B specials, this is what people remembering, weren't declared an enemy until 21 months after the campaign had started. There were many instances of bombs being set off and blowing up B special halls. After they went home, they didn't go in and bomb them. Like the boys in the in the the, the, 70s, the 60s or, or the 70s and the 80s uh, would have been much more ruthless. And I, ha I go back again to what that man, one of the lads said, to a, a gentleman's war in many ways, you know. Just when you were talking earlier about not having uh, weapons and things, and um, would you be able to tell me about Pat O'Donnell? Involvement in Operation Harvest and in arm smuggling. Well, that comes up a little bit later. Um, in 1958, uh, Brendan O'Neill and I had occasion to go to Dublin uh, to meet with his uncle, Tyg Lynch, who was a person who was highly involved in the IRA in the 40s. Uh, at the 30s and 40s in West Cork. His brother was Jack Lynch, who's well known, has been well known in Republican circles as well. Uh, Ty was the manager of Harold's Cross Greyhound Track in Dublin. Uh, he had a, a, a kennels out in a place called Balbutcher. And we, 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 we were looking for a return to the north. Brendan, I, Charlie, O'Neill, Brendan's brother Jim, uh, and several others wanted to get back up. We weren't deterred. But at that particular time, the Republicans in Cork, the movement, had stood away from it. They weren't sending anybody back up. This wasn't something that was happening in Cork alone, by the way. There's instances of, of Terry O'Toole in Port Leash and uh, 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 Foley below and from Kerry. Uh, one of them went up and uh, to the north and um, became involved, joined the British Army and went back down to Dublin and volunteered. I, I want to go in and become involved. You know, they weren't, they weren't they, in, from their areas. There was no send up. Cork wasn't the only crowd. Uh, Mac Logan's Ballywick above in Port Leash, he was the same, one of the long time leaders of the Republican movement at the time, played a very negative role in it, and several others, the likes of Charlie Murphy, um, Sean Cronin, J.P. O'Hagan, who were leading the movement in the early part of the, the, the campaign were being handcuffed by a lot of these people. And the queer thing about it, they were going away and they were collecting arms and stuff like that. In other words, collecting arms and handing them into the hands of young volunteers up the country and they bloody well wouldn't support it. what was going on at all. So Brendan O'Neill and I, Charlie uh, Renan from Middleton, Three of us who had been in the north and were experienced wanted to go back up and we wouldn't be left in, in, in vain. Like we went up to Dublin, we went over the heads of the crowd in Cork. But we claimed exceptional circumstances and Ty Lynch was able to get us an interview with the, the top brass in the GHQ, Sean Cronin, Charlie Murphy and J.B. O'Hagan. And we outlined our case to them as I said, claiming exceptional circumstances. That was in early 58. Incidentally, by about November, there was a meeting being held in Dublin, a general army convention, and the Cork Road were recorded as wanting to B 
be modified or pacified because they were complaining about their lack of, of, of their losses. But an analysis was done of that. And our losses were way below what losses were in Dublin and Belfast and places like that. They were still cribbing about having lost people at a very early stage. They should have got out of it. An awful lot of those people should have got out. But I'd like to come back to what you were asking me about. As a result of that, we became we got in contact with them and made our case. And they said they'd see into it for us. But the thing is like that. We were talking to Toig as well at that particular time. And those were the people running the movement at that particular time. In the sense that army councils don't run it, it's the GHQ run it. And attempts were being made to bring in arms. And there was an offer which was started off by Toig Lynch, who was in the 40s in the colour as well, and left wing in his outlook. He had contact with a Gerald O'Reilly, who he was from the Midland somewhere now, but he was in New York for years. He was at one stage a member of the Communist Party in America as well. He was big into trade union work over there. And he had contact with the American group that had been out in Spain in the, in the Spanish Civil War period. And he had good contacts. And he put a proposition, and uh, it was accepted. I haven't said that like, I suppose anybody who could propose to get in arms were welcome anyway. But um, he went about it, got on to Gerald O'Reilly. Gerald made the moves, and um, they, came, they came in contact with some people in, in, in Paris. Uh, they came in contact with a man called, uh, to read this now, uh -huh. Julio uh, Alvarez de, Ve de, Vago, de Vago. He was a minister, a foreign minister in the Popular Front government during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, he ended up uh, in Paris at some stage later. He was... Uh, the communist. Uh, I've read it somewhere that he, he was a bit of a Maoist, but um, he was a chief lieutenant of a guy called Largo Caballero, who Moscow pushed forward at one stage and, and don, donned him with the title the Spanish Lenin, but he was well connected and disposed to giving arms. Now, Toy was the man who was to go out and uh, handle the matter. But unfortunately, Sean Cronin, his chief of staff, they were staying at the time, occasionally, the three most wanted men in Ireland, they were staying up with, in Drumcondra, with Pather O'Donnell and his wife. In other words, they were being harboured by them, at great risk for all those people who would have scorned uh, O'Donnell because he didn't support the movement and all the rest of it. It wasn't like that at all. But Cronin asked O'Donnell to go out there, and in all fairness to O'Donnell, he did go there, and he went. But he was the wrong man. Ty Lynch was like a dog over it. He'd have known. He was to go. It wasn't for his own ego, because he knew if he went, it was going to be successful. But there were differences between the CP people and O'Donnell, which went back to the Civil War period. Evidently, uh, Padre O'Donnell was uh, around the, um, the northern area of, of Spain um, and it was highly involved, it was highly 
the anarchists were there, very strong. And he was in conversation with them and he was discussing to a great extent agrarian problems and matters like that. Whereas the communist group were down in Madrid. And he, had, he, he went back, he went out and back and there was a bit of sniping here and there that he could have done more, you know. But anyway, this guy, um, De Vego, De Ve De Veo, uh, knew about him and immediately he found out he was dealing with Padre O'Donnell. That was the end of it. It didn't come off. An interesting little aside, perspective for those who would have been niggling about O'Donnell wasn't interested. They're always kind of mounting up all the people who saw sense like they wouldn't have anything to do. But he did. He, he tried his best. I, 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 the fact that he was the wrong man like, is not material. And as well as that, these people, under other circumstances, would have supplied stuff, you know? Um, Jim, could you tell me about some of the central figures active within the Republican movement in the 1950s, maybe 60s? People like Jack McKay, Tom Collins, Collins uh, Thomas McCartan Jr., and Jerry Lawless, people like that, or other people you can think of. Yeah, well, some and their, of those. And their were, politics as well. Yes, so some of those things. were prominent mm -hmm. and others were not. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll try and sort it out in some ways. Thomas McCartan was a member of the Army Council a very important person in, in the, the movement at that time. I've already mentioned Sean Cronin, who was a former Free State soldier, uh, uh, officer and became involved. He was, there was attempts to bell rag him at one stage by certain traditionalist types within the movement because they found out, I think his wife was supposed to be Russian and my God of all things, she was up before the Un-American Activities Committee being investigated. Oh, terrible stuff altogether. Like, these are the things they kind of try and put you down for, like, you know? Uh, so what, like? But Charlie Murphy was a very highly involved person in the movement at that time, you know? Um, Tony McCann, of course, was chief of staff. Um, Uh, Lawless like was a side figure in the sense that some say that he was supposed to be involved with McChrystal. I, I don't know what the, the connection was like, but um, there was one time all right they made a, 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 an incursion up towards the north. I don't know was he involved in the burning of the the customs houses. About a week, about a fortnight before the um, Operation Harvest started. Um, if you're talking about like the dissident element, McChrystal would have been the more well known figure at that particular time, you know. Jack McCabe then comes under a different kind of category. <coughs> Jack McCabe was amongst those who I used to meet regularly. <coughs> from the 50, from that particular period on. Um, <coughs> he was a friend of Joe Collins, who was with him in prison in England. Um, they were involved in the bombing campaign. Um, a friend of Harry White. A friend of Joe Carr. And several others. Uh, I mentioned there in one of the things, he was also a good friend of <coughs> a man called Packy Early, who was a member of the CPEG in Dublin. I met him. I found him a, a, a nice guy to talk to. I knew his background and what he was involved in. He had originally been in the IRA. Worked hard as the, the, the Connolly Association in the 40s uh, to. Uh, seek the release of the Republican prisoners in England. And uh, we used to meet throughout the, 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 the 50s and into the 60s 
in Dublin, out in Jack's house, Jack McCabe. But they weren't members of the army. McCann and Logan and all those people saw to it that they were kept outside. They were considered uh, loose cannons, gunmen and all those kind of things. They were not the kind of a movement they were trying to build up. More responsible and all the rest of it. Like, was it? Yeah, like, Joe Collins is a matter of interest. On several occasions we'd have meetings and when Joe would be becoming exasperated with some of them, Joe would say, I don't know about you. I'm a communist anyway. I'm not a member of the party, but I'm a bloody communist. And Jack would smile. But Packy would be delighted to hear that. But they were our, they were our teachers by positive example. There were a lot of others, and there were teachers by negative example. That comes from Mo, by the way. But um, have, I, have I dealt with what you were? Yes, that's, that's fine. Saying? Yeah, I've just, you know, just there was a lot of those people that I've almost yes. forgotten, really. Did I forget anybody there? By the way, as to the people you might have thought would be. Popular. No, no. Well known. I added in a few like that. And when did you become interested in the working class politics, in working class politics, and how did you become interested in the idea of Marx? And what was the attitude of Republicans to your way of thinking? Well, look, as a young man, 54, I was very anti colonialist. I particularly, of course, as you can understand, cast an eye on British colonialism. I supported, in my own mind anyway, at an early stage, their fight, the fight of the Israeli people against uh, the British occupation in Palestine. History kind of puts big question marks over all that. I admire their style, the way they dealt with the British, how they got rid of the cat and nine tails that was being given to them by bringing out five or six British officers and giving them in public to the cat and nine tails. That ended that. Uh, King David Hotel and things like that impressed me, I suppose. And of course, the world supported those people at the time. They were favourable, including the Soviet Union, to change and doing something for them. That doesn't mean like that. We would support Menachem Begin. I read his book, by the way. I was interested. But we read our books. We should read a lot of books from people of different involvements in change in the country. I would have supported of, of the Eoka in their fight against the British in Cyprus. I would have been aware of what was happening in Malaya and other parts of Africa as well, and, and Asia, of what was happening there. I remember with great satisfaction listening to the radio on the downfall of D&B and Foo. Was it... Uh, I can't think of the man's name. Um, that was... The, 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 apart from Ho Chi Minh, one of the great military leaders of the Vietnamese at that time, against the French... I was on their side, uh, the Vietnamese. So like when we come later to talk about Vietnam and that struggle, it goes back there for me. But then um, all those things like 
begin to put, put things together for you. I became interested in uh, Connolly's writings, particularly so that he took time out to give a chapter to a Cotman, William Thompson, Protestant, born in Patrick Street. A lot of people thought it was down in West Cork, but no, it was Patrick Street, centre of the city. Uh, even if, if understood by Marx to be a, a good uh, person to put forward socialism at an early stage. I, I became kind of slowly involved in those things, and um, I got a lot of it at home as well. Like my father used to sit down when we came in from work, and if he was in on time, there wasn't much talk, be chatting away about the book. But if the father was late, my mother would say, oh, he's on one of those marches again. He was walking in Fords in, Cash, in, in Cork, and in those days, the, uh, wages were always spoken about, in pennies, an hour. It wasn't so much the week's wages at all. Of can we get a penny or twopence or sixpence increase and all that kind of thing? I used to, I used to pick all, all this thing was coming into the head, like I was getting all this. And now, uh, my father would be out late because they used to, before all these laws came in in more recent years, they used to folly the black legs. They'd wait until they came out of work at five or six o'clock and they'd all break into groups and they'd go all over the city following the black legs and they'd stand outside their houses and show black leg and all that kind of thing. Um, they weren't beating anybody, right? they were just making the protest. I kind of came up with that. In fact, there was a time, like I went on strike at 12, 11, 12 years of age with I used to do the papers for the man across the road, I collect them in the parcel, parcels, and uh, uh, the, the, the cinema went up to, from fourpence to fivepence, and I was only getting fourpence, and I went over and I said, Marty, I said, I'm not working for fourpence anymore. I want sixpence, and I was outside the door for a whole bloody week, and I wouldn't do the papers, and they brought in the, the local cake man, from Thompson's, and he told me big word. He says, "No, you mightn't understand what it is. I'm I'm here as the arbitrator. Of course, I know what it was. All right, I got all that at home from the father. So he brought the two of us together, and beat, look, to cut a long story short, your man was beaten down. He wouldn't give me anything. I was in for sixpence, and he was beaten down to give. I, I, I said, will it take for fivepence? And I mm, appeared reluctant, but I'll take the five pence. Of course, I was getting four, the cinema was five, I put in for six, but I got the five. Because the father was saying, you don't ever put in for just exactly what you want, you put in for a bit extra. So you get all these things. Like, the rich man's son didn't get all those kind of uh, upbringings at all, from whence we came. That is, that leaves an impression upon us, you know. But yeah, I got involved because, as well as that, we got people into the into Sinn Féin as well. And in no time at all, I was being told to keep away from some of these people. Uh, some of them had come in uh, from uh, the Cork Socialist uh, Party, as they call themselves, in the late forties. In particular, Jerry Higgins, Georgie Sisk, and a few of those people. And it was at that time the CP, under the leadership of Jim Savage, started going around referring to the Republicans as dinosaurs. They had nothing to offer. So that at a later stage, when lo and behold, they started being supportive of Republicans after the campaign had ended in 62, 63, they started becoming supportive. Now, when the campaign opened in 56, and I'd like to go back to that again because there are a few other things to say about that. Um, the Soviet paper, Trud, it was the paper of the United Trade Unions, in Moscow. Mm -hmm. They issued a statement 
congratulating the Irish, the IRA, for opening the campaign in its fight against imperialism. And that was very heartening. It was published in the local paper, the Evening Echo, I think it was. And until such time as the Walkers League or party, I don't know what they called themselves at the time, that was the partitionist formation of the communist movement in Ireland. They had the CPNI and they had the Walkers League or party. They came and c condemned it. And they, but they lost some people following that. And these people I'm talking about came into the Republican movement in Sinn Féin. I got in contact with them. We used to have little chats together. And we had Jim O'Regan, who was out in, in, in uh, Spain fighting for Republicans uh, in, the, in, the, in the 30s. He was there as well. And a, a few others. We had a fellow called Norman Latchford, who was a former Connolly Association person. We had uh, Mick Fitz, a Republican, strong Republican all his life, but left wing, good trade union man. We used to meet in the Ash, uh, the, the Republican Hall, and we used to have chats together. And uh, it was all left wing, but we wouldn't have minded anybody else to come over and chat with us. We weren't kind of like a little sect at all. But they didn't. Because there was no great interest in republic in, 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 in politics. Like Sinn Fein used to say at that time, we are not a party. We're a, we're a national organization. They made that out. You see, Sinn Fein was r resurrected by McGann and those people as a front organization to scoop in people. They, 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 they weren't political, but no, they did take part in elections at one stage in the north, but that was an opportunist thing. There's something that came on them, and they went forward, and they were a bit surprised how well they done. That wouldn't be the first time they got a bit of a surprise. I mean, we, we could deal with that at a later stage. But um, we used to have a chat, and we'd done it all about that. I was called aside by the Cora Kilter, chairperson at the time, uh, Derek McKenna, and warned off that I should be careful of my company. You know, they were reds. And uh, we'd have to deal with that in time, all this all kind of rubbish. Um, I kind of bring in the, the, the question of uh, at a later stage, when the um, Unemployed movement came about around 1958. Jack Murphy was elected in, in the north, or sorry, in Dublin, in Dublin as right, a yeah. candidate. He was a former internee and he was elected. He came to Cork. He spoke on platforms. I remember going to meetings and listening to him talking. We're well able to chat. Bit of a demagogue, I thought, in ways. Did Pat O'Donnell work for him as well? Didn't he? Pat O'Donnell work for I don't Jack know. Murphy up in Dublin? Yeah, I wouldn't be altogether like... The uh, Crystal uh, people uh, did, and no Joe Crystal in I wouldn't be altogether well. know it, what was happening mm -hmm. in Dublin. And how but did the, the unemployment uh, movement, did that take off in Cork as well? Yes, it did. Yeah. Now, let me say this much. I praise every uh, everybody as I, as I come to them. Jim Savage of the CP, Walker's Group and all the rest of it, was a backroom man with that. He wasn't unemployed, but he was involved in the backroom. And he done Trojan work for them. I, I, I say that much. Liam Flavin, uh, who was involved with us afterwards um, in Irish Revolutionary Forces days, uh, worked hard with it. I remember during that period under the, under the unemployed movement he issued a strong statement of criticism when De Valera in 58 or 57 opened the Curra internment camp. Uh, they gave out hell about, about it. Um, there was a mix of people in it at that time. It kind of kept left from people together. 
I, I was implied at the time, but I went out and walked with him. I remember going down in the back of the lorry down to Cove one night, amongst other things, you know. Uh, I worked. But I was being threatened by people within the Sinn Féin movement then. And how did Sinn Féin and, and Republicans, like the Republican movement in Cork, well, did they welcome the unemployed campaign? They didn't. They put their head in the sand. You see, they, they had this thing all the time of the division between the state, the free state, and their vision of the Republic, and the continuation as they saw it from, I think it was 1938, when the old remnants of the first doll handed over the, le the leadership of the nation, as they saw it, to the IRA Army Council. And they had this attitude towards it. And they didn't welcome Jack Murphy's uh, uh, victory. Rather, they were critical. And the unemployed in Cork couldn't depend upon their support for anything. Nevertheless, many in the unemployed in Cork were ex-internees. Liam Flavin, uh, as he was more or less the, a leading light in, the, in that, had been in the Corridor during the 40s and had issued that statement in relation to uh, the internment in, in by De Valera. Uh, but I, I, I mean, I wrote about it in the past, but I remember one night in particular, because I was there, uh, they had been left down for the use of, of Carpenter's Hall, which was up the street from the Ash Hall. And um, there were... Uh, there was a, a mix-up there. The, 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 the caretaker got mixed up on the nights and wasn't there. And they had nowhere to go. And they walked down the street to the Thomas Ash Hall. Oh, if I, ever, if I had anything to do with it and others who were anxious to become involved with the walking people, to be open the door to them. But they wouldn't have them. They wouldn't touch them. They turned them away. And the Liam Flavins were there, the ex internees and all the rest of it. And they were shocked that they were turned away. But their attitude was... They have a member in the doll, the 26 county doll. We couldn't touch them. And they instructed their members they were to have nothing to do with the unemployed movement and that they could face expulsion and all the rest of it. I was taken aside myself and threatened and all the rest of it. But they, like, they, sometimes they didn't, they were kind of sizing up whether they should or shouldn't, like, and I didn't, I got through, like, they didn't go further against me on it. Oh, and I got a few other uh, warnings uh, as time went on, like about uh, being involved with these reds and all the rest of it, you know. But uh, so much for them. Now, uh, Staying with the Operation Harvest, um, I'd like to make mention of another area, apart from West Tyrone, where we had Corkmen, um, understandably coming from Cork. I had to chat a bit more about the people from Cork who, who took part in the campaign. I, I want to go on to North Antrim. We sustained three losses there on the first night. Jimmy Lennon, Willie Goff, no longer with us, and Tony Cooney. Now, just to briefly mention what happened there. Uh, they were on the way to a radar station. I, I was supposed to be unmanned at the time. And there was a car following them. And it was dark of night. And at some stage, they assumed their car was behind. They stopped. I think Tony got Tony, who Tony got out, and walked back to a carload of RUC and B specials. And it kind of it went bang from that on. This, when the lads found out, they scattered. They went down bank sides, and the, 
there was a, a few shots fired here and there and they were arrested. No, that was re referred to at the time as the Torhead fiasco or what, what you want to call it. Um, it's been said that the police were watching that night and they were on to him. What actually happened was the second car took the wrong turn and just the RUC were behind them. It was just bad luck. But the thing was that it wasn't intended that the court people at that time would end up up in the very north of the country. There was talk in advance of the campaign that the court group would be together. But that didn't happen. Uh, there was four court people in West Tyrone. There was six in North Antrim. Ten. Out of 18, uh, 17 from Cork City and a courtman who was in Dublin with the Dublin Brigade, Sean Daly. But um, just towards the starting of it, they were told they were going to North Antrim. They went up there. The guns weren't there for them. They were to come up from Belfast from Belfast. They sent down for him. They were refused him. They were a bit gripey in Belfast because they realised they were out of the campaign at that particular time. So they had to go over to Derry, County Derry I think, to get some stuff. A bad start like, you know. But on that night there was a fair amount of police involved around that part of the country and speaking to people who were up there and I talked about it for many a day after that in jail a lot of them um, they had reason to believe from what they heard was that it, it, the police were there for another reason there was an exercise taking place off the north coast uh, a NATO exercise and that's why there was a fair amount of police activity up around the northern part of the country and it's of interest also that after they were arrested within 45 minutes half an hour to 45 minutes um, of this this man um, Sir Richard Pym who was the top man in the RUC, appeared on the scene. To what was a small incident in many ways, but he appeared on the scene and it was, it was said to me that there were, it was as well that he did appear on the scene because they were being really roughed up, they were being kicked about and battered by the combination of RUC and B-Specials at the time. Um, in particular, they mentioned two men called Green and Hamilton who were really going tough on them. But when, Ham, when, when Sir Richard Pym arrived, he, he started questioning them and they just gave their names and where they were from and they wouldn't go any further as soldiers of the Irish Republican Army that were saying, that's it. And he accepted that. But it happened that Green and Hamilton were called aside by him and he told them you are looking after these men bring them to the RUC station which is in Ballycastle and they were brought there and they told me like the, those who came out of prison in thing, that those two fellas who were given the job by Pym bloody well looked after them from there on in they didn't want any complaints back to Pym. Uh, they were quite, other than that, like when they were out of their sight, uh, they were being pushed around the, the barrack and things like that. Uh, things were kind of fairly tough at the time, like, you know. Uh, but, I mean, that, that's the way things went there. Um, 
there were six cartmen up there. And um, like uh, it's well for records like that I should just mention. Liam Heafy was there, Donald Canty, Sean Carey, Jimmy Lenehan arrested, Willie Goff arrested, and Tony Cooney arrested. Um, just to go back on the east, the West Tyrone area, uh, Brendan O'Neill, myself, Jim Lane, um, Charlie Ronan from Middleton, and Jackie McMahon from Mallow. That's ten out of uh, seventeen from Cork City. There. You know? And Dahi O'Connell, he was in the north as well, wasn't he? Uh, or was he, he called he, Dave O'Connell at that time? He would have been called. Well, sorry, I must excuse myself now to and say occasionally to you that um, I would be referring to people, and I'm not being, dis I mean, not being bad about the Irish language or anything, but like it comes from the past. I always knew the man known as Dahi O'Connor, as Dave O'Connor. And there are several. I'd be talking about Rory Brady, not Rory O'Broad. I can understand that. Like, you know, that's, it was about 1960, there was a big change in the movement. Up to then, all the candidates, were their names were in English. Uh, but at one stage, they decided that they'd all have to use their names in Irish. And some of them continued with that. Some were a bit dissatisfied with it when it came to the elections because their names didn't always translate as they might have wanted as to how they'd appear on the electoral form. Like in Cork, you had Liam Early, and he became known, he went up in East Cork, I think, and he was known as Liam O'Macor. And McCor and Early. People weren't great at understanding the difference, but I, out of out of remembrance, as I knew them, like I I, I call them that. You know, though, as one other thing, I beat when I'm talking, and I talk to the army about the army. I'm referring to the Irish Republican Army. Like if it's the free if it's the Free State Army, I will mention the the Free State Army. Like you know, that's my generation, that's my Republican background, and. There's no great reason why I should change. Um, there were the people in Cork, and I, I just want to mention the other few. John Madden uh, was in East Tyrone or somewhere like that. Uh, he brother of Jerry Madden. Um, Mick Murphy, the pipe major of the Cork Volunteer Pipe Band, he was up there. He died some short while after he came back in an accident in Verome Dockyard. Alfie Lane, no relation, same name. Jerry Collins, died young. Mick Buckley, still with us. Dave O'Connor, I mentioned. And Ted Murphy of Cross Barry, still alive in his 86, I think. I was talking to him recently. And uh, that would have been 17. And there was one other corpman there, but he was working in Dublin at the time. He was part of the Dublin Brigade, and that was Sean Daly, um, who at a later stage was involved with Sarah in Cork, the Irish Revolutionary Forces, um, and as I said, Sarah and matters like that. Um, so there we are, like with respects to to the, the operation harvest. Shut my brave and gallant few. 
Sean Tracy, Denny Lacey, and Tom Barry's famous crew. We're not free yet, but we won't forget until our dying day. Oh, the black and tans like lightning ran from the rifles of the...